Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons that are prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Galatians. It's entitled The Gospel in Galatians, and this particular lesson is number five in that series for July 29 of 2017. It um, is entitled Old Testament Faith. You're going to find this very challenging if you've really studied the book of Galatians, have an idea what's going on. I found it very challenging, so stay tuned. Let's see what we can make of it. First of all, of course, we will always start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, it's a privilege to study your word. It's a privilege to learn more about the work of your Holy Spirit, to learn about the message that you have for us in, in this small book written by Paul so many years ago. We know that to many people the books of Galatians and Romans are the primary place where the truth about the gospel is set forth. May we understand that. May we be able to speak it, to say it, to explain it the best possible way is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this lesson is about, believe it or not, curses, substitutions, and salvation by faith alone. So what, what sort of pops up in your mind when somebody says those kinds of words? Well, let's, let's get our orient, let's get our feet in the water. Let's read Galatians 3, 1 to 5. You foolish Galatians, who put a spell on you? Before your very eyes, you had a clear description of the death of Jesus on the cross. Tell me this one thing. Did you receive God's Spirit by doing what the law requires or by hearing the gospel and believing it? How can you be so foolish? You began by God's Spirit. Do you now want to finish by your own power? Did all of your experience mean nothing at all? Surely it meant something. Does God give you the spirit to work miracles among you because you do what the law requires or because you hear the gospel and believe it? Okay, how's that for a start? Clearly, Paul was upset by the news he had received from Galatia. And I guess we should review, just review very quickly, where is Galatia? Turkey. Okay, what part of Turkey do you know? Northern. Okay, northern and western part of Turkey, especially. Why is it called Galatia? The Gauls came from, probably from France. France. Yeah, people came down from Europe, presumably the Gauls from, from France, and established themselves there as a group of people. Of course, I'm sure by this time, that was probably hundreds of years before Paul was writing. So by this time, I'm sure they were intermingled with the other people who were living in that area. So, but. Um, the Greek word in this passage, sometimes translated as foolish, we've gotten used to that word foolish, is actually a word which means mindless, which might correctly be translate, translated as dumb or stupid. Now, you know, we've already seen that Paul doesn't hesitate to say what he thinks, you know. Anybody else has a different gospel than the one I preach to, let him be condemned to hell. So he's sort of speaking his mind, right? Well, he's saying, you people are just literally stupid. Don't Why you, would those... Yeah? Don't you think that he is saying something a little more intelligent than stupid? He's probably saying, you are believing something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the point, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if we accept to believe something that is not logical, shame on us. Yeah. It can't come from God. Now, of course, you're already flying in face of a lot of Christian theology when you say that. Yes. And a lot of people just say, have faith. You don't have to understand anything. You don't need to ask any questions. Just have faith. Well, go, go clear back to Tertullian in the uh, third century. Yes. If, 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 and if it was, he wasn't alone. I think Augustine had some of that. Uh, the idea is, if, you, if it makes sense, if it's logical, it's not faith. Mm -hmm. and yeah. it, it's so I mean, what do you do with that? Well, Paul goes on to suggest that maybe they were bewitched. I mean, think of telling a Jew that you're under the control of the devil, you know? Undoubtedly, and, and, and I mean, you can look at that. Just look at, look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 
Now this is Corinthians, of course. They do not believe because their minds have been kept in the dark by the evil God of this world. He keeps them from seeing the light shining on them, the light that comes from the good news about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So he's saying, you people who receive the gospel and now are trying to run away from it, you just, you're just accepting the devil's gospel. That last part you read, was, that, was he talking about the Galatians? or the Not people, necessarily, but the, some other, the Corinthians that were probably behaving similar to what the Galatians were behaving. Well, these Judaizers that Paul was talking about, what's a Judaizer? In order to be saved, you have to do all the laws, all the rules that are written in the Old Testament and the law of Moses. All the ceremonial laws, you have to be circumcised in addition yeah. to everything else. So they were trying to suggest if you want to be a real saint, a super saint, you have to do all these things. Now, the rest of you people, yeah, okay, well, you can do what you want to do, but you want to be a real saint, you need to do all these things. Well, our naturally selfish natures would love to accept the idea that we could somehow do something that would help to earn our way to heaven. Or else get somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> okay. That's even more nonsensical. Would that give us a basis for boasting? Does it make you feel helpless to realize that you can't do anything to earn your salvation? Does it bother you to let the Holy Spirit take the time and work with you to change your life? Does Bible study, prayer, and witnessing excite you or they seem like a chore. Well, until we realize that we're poor in sp spirit, we can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Uh, in Christ's object lessons, uh, 159, she says, no outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire re renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Wow. Incredible words. Well, he goes on, Paul goes on in the same verse as, before your very eyes, you had a clear description of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. What does that imply? Was he discussing why Jesus had to die? Well, it, it's basic. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to mm -hmm. myself. So, Excuse me. It says all. Hmm? The, Not all men. The text is all. is all. The Greek. No. What did I say? You said all, all men. men. It, it, most people do it, so it, it, that's, that's the way we're it's conditioned. Implied. Well, all mankind. I, I'm no, sure that don't leave me out. It's all, in, well. all intelligent creatures. <laughs> in fact, all of his whole creation. Yeah, Helen all. White says that that includes all of the entire universe okay. that he was talking yeah. about. Not just fine. But, when they, but when he's lifted up, yeah. he will draw, see. Yeah. Right. There's, there's more to things than just exactly. drawing, but that's really where it begins. Mm -hmm. You know, do you sense Christ drawing you and uh, and then then you submit to whatever extent you're able at that time. Don't you think it, that he was he was saying that uh, you were listening to me and you got it. Mm -hmm. You 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 could see it happen, you could see where it goes, you can see why it was important. And now they yeah I, I, excuse me, but I, I'm sorry I jumped in on you oh, and that's okay. say, say it that way. But some years ago, the general editor of this, uh, the RSV, gave, uh, it was when I was uh, members of Bible Collector Society back in early uh, 2000s. Anyway, he chose that text, John uh, uh, 1232, 12, 30, uh, 12, 12, 32. 32, as to how uh, Bible translators do their work. And they put the word men in there to clarify things. <laughs> so I was at the back of the room and I raised my hand. Do you think that it would have been better if they'd left the word men out and then it would have been more in keeping with uh, what Paul says in Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10? It went over like a lead balloon. 
Yeah. Because nobody understood any idea. The, the context, uh, what, yeah. what was what going on. But that's what everything D Jesus has done since he began to create intelligent creatures is to bring everybody into harmony with his yeah. creation. Atonement. The, atonement. Ato atonement. Yeah. atonement. Yeah, the not words, atonement, but at one meant. Yeah. The, the words clear description there uh, in Greek literally means to, to paint a huge billboard or a placard or something else like that. Reminds me of the story of John Huss. Do you remember his story? Outside the city of, of um, it was, uh, was it Prague? He was, I think it was Prague he was living in at that point in time. They, 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 he made, they, the, the Catholic Church was trying to make the whole city banned or, or, you know, so you couldn't baptize, you couldn't do anything. And so he, I don't know, he was directly responsible himself for painting, but they painted a picture, two big, two big posters outside, right? at the gate of the city. One that shows the Pope and all his finery and then the other one that shows Jesus Christ riding on the lamb. <laughs> just just let donkey. things to speak on the, don on the donkey, I'm sorry. Uh, let, the, let them speak for themselves. Well, so does this imply that by turning away from Paul's view, that one that he called the only gospel, they were rejecting Christ? You know, I, th I think it was mostly what they were, they were replacing what, what he said with. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it didn't make sense. Um, it sounded like they were impressed with the last people that talked to him. Yeah. yeah. And that's what he was kind of upset about. So the question is, and in, in, in focusing a little bit more on why that might be really important, do we believe that Jesus died not just the first death, but also the second death? that's described in Genesis 2, verse 17. Let's just, let's just look at that very quickly. Well, how would you connect that with this? Well, we'll see if we can do that. Okay. God said to Adam and Eve, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you'll die the same day. So, he, in essence, he was saying what? Sin leads to death, right? That's spelled out in considerable detail, well not in detail, but just very pointedly in Isaiah 52, 59 verse 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And what did Jesus say on the, right on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that was out of the Bible mm -hmm. because David said it too. Yeah. So why did he say it? Well, because he felt like was being, he was being separated from God. And Jesus was really being separated from God. David just felt like he was being separated from God. But he didn't die. No. Certainly he didn't die the second death. So let's ask the question, what could be the question, the obvious question, what do you think attracted the Galatians to Paul's message the first time? He was speaking out of the mouth of Jesus, mm -hmm. the message of Jesus. It's not that they left Jesus or that they abandoned Jesus. They abandoned the truth that Jesus had brought to them. Yeah. And I'm afraid that if Paul was to write to us today, mm -hmm. he might tell us some of those very same things. But if, now let me, uh, and I agree with what you've said, but let, let's talk for just a moment, heathen pagans. And Paul is preaching to them, and he's trying to convince them that this is important to them. What do you suppose would appeal to a heathen pagan about Paul's message? You don't have to go through all these ceremonies and all these pay all these prices and inflict your body with pain and so on to be saved. Okay. There's a possibility. God will accept you. You don't have to worry about these gods that require many things. Well, I think also um, this God, the salvation was for everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. it was for the lowest person in the world to the highest person of the world. Mm -hmm. And that was really something different that, that the pagans that never everybody. said. Everybody, okay. Mm -hmm. Is it also significant that, remember, the thing that was shocking to people was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Is it possible that one of the reasons why his message was potent and, and attractive is because he said, 
let me tell you about what happens after you die or what can happen after you die. Just ask that question. Well, he goes on, he says, how did the Galatians receive the Spirit? What did he mean when he said, you received the Spirit? Was that a Pentecostal type experience? Do, do you know of any other people who had Pentecostal kind of experiences? There were those in, that Paul found, I think, was in Ephesus that had been baptized with the baptism of John, mm -hmm. and then they okay. had the <coughs> he uh, prayed for them, and they were baptized with the Spirit. Okay, can you well, think of any Cornelius others? Cornelius and his family. <coughs> Cornelius. Remember Cornelius and his family. Paul, uh, Peter went up there and preached to them, and suddenly, bang, he says, and, and Peter has to go back to the people in Jerusalem. He says, what were you doing over there eating with that Gentile? He says, okay, let me, let me ask you a question. How do you explain the fact that God came down on them exactly as they came down on us at the day of Pentecost? And he says, hmm, hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> and they finally says, okay. Well, I think whatever it was, it mm. was different than what mm. these other teachers, what came from these other teachers. Yeah. And that was a point he was trying to make also. Yeah, the other teachers were saying, if you do this and 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 this, maybe you'll be saved. Where did those other teachers get that? Was that from the Old Testament? Well, that was from well, the Pharisees. Well, yeah, it was from them. But did the Pharisees somehow get it from the Old Testament, or did they completely make it up? Well, no. The, if you asked a Pharisee, they would, have, they would say that those are all based on things. It was, it, they would interpret one part of the old, say, some verse in the Bible, and they would look at it and look at it and say, well, I think it means this, and then someone else would come along and look at what that person said. Well, I think it means this too, and then this too, and this too, and by, you got extrapolated way out there, from what was originally these words, and you end up with it saying twice the, just the opposite of what it originally said, but they thought it was still derived from that original verse. I mean, go back and read the Mishnah, for example, and see for yourself. Well, I think, I think part of the thing was that, what was I going to say? <laughs> that, that the, um, the people were being converted just by faith, by mm -hmm. accepting. And these Jews, they've gone through a lot of teaching. You know, right. they've discussed things through the synagogue, and they've, they feel like they're sophisticated enough to really know what's going mm -hmm. on. And so you've got these other people here that all of a sudden they're saved because they believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I think they were kind of worried about that. Mm -hmm. But I... I you're getting, 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 getting away with too, too easy price, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> what I was thinking. Well, look at, follow Paul's argument. He starts out in this Galatians 2, 1 to 10, he says, look, he says, you people have a question about my gospel. I went straight to the apostles in Jerusalem, and I sat down with them for two weeks. We discussed this, and they said, they gave me the stamp of approval. Okay, more than that, sometime later, when I was preaching and teaching in Antioch, one of those very apostles, Peter, came to Antioch and, and, and he was doing fine. He was just, he was doing all what, what they should do. Everybody was treated equally and we, he sat down and ate with the, with the, uh, Galatia, I mean, with the um, former pagans and the, the non-Jews and so forth. And then those people from Jerusalem came and, oh, well, Peter backs off and Barnabas backs off and Paul says, I didn't tolerate that for a second. I condemned Peter to his face and in public. So, um, what's Paul trying to tell us? The church leaders aren't infallible. What? <laughs> Is that true today too? <laughs> how, how could that be? Well, Peter is kind of supporting <coughs> elitism, wasn't he? Yeah. So that's not very good. That that's exactly good. what, but see, that's exactly what the Judaizers are promoting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, we're all, none of us are infallible, so we, we yeah. have to. Approach. We're no better than the church leaders? That's right. <laughs> we have to approach everything with, with all humility and 
Well, Paul ends up by saying, do you really want to give up that experience that you had with me back in the beginning? Yes, so go ahead. Paul was kind of saying, because I spent two weeks with the church leaders and they agreed with me, mm -hmm. does that imply that it was right? So, by inference, does something that comes from the church leaders, is that correct? Well, I, every time someone asks that question, and I ask myself that question, I try to imagine a conference between Paul and the early church leaders. They were uneducated fishermen from Galilee. But they'd he, received he is, the Holy Spirit and they were I'm educated not, I'm at not that argue, time. I'm not arguing with that. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, educated by the highest university in the land with all that kind of stuff. I mean, and how did those, how did they interact? Well, I, I think Paul, one of the reasons why he'd go back there is to hear their stories. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a discussion about theology. What did Jesus do? What, what, why do you think he did yeah. this? Why do you think mm -hmm. he did that? Yeah. And where, where did you say he went? All these places. And why did he go there? You know? Paul and that was the, kind of the discussion. Yeah. Paul also in 1 Corinthians says that we know in part and we prophesy in part. So even though he was sure of what he believed, he knew it was only part of it. And so checking it with other people mm -hmm. who had had uh, experience, particularly people who had been with Christ yeah. for all those years, you know, they certainly came up short at the time of the crucifixion, but when the Holy Spirit fell on them and brought all those things to their remembrance, mm -hmm. they had an education that was far greater than he had had in the worldly schools in a, in a sense. What do we, how do we judge ourselves, whether we're going to be saved? How do we decide whether we're doing all right in our Christian walk? Do we look at the other people in the church and say, well, I'm at least as good as those people? I think so, it depends on how you believe God is. Uh -huh. I mean, that's, that's... Does God grade, grade on the curve? Well, what do you think, does he? <laughs> in, uh, I mean, and there's a lot of people who think so. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we should not yeah. be comparing ourselves yeah. with one another. Okay. The, uh, another aspect is that we've got to be very careful to take some of these statements chronologically mm -hmm. because sometimes we kind of jump to certain conclusions not having realized that all of them had to learn through that period of time. And it's true that some of them figured out certain things before others, but does the Holy, is the Holy Spirit a person who falls on you and suddenly you have all the truth? Well, we know that's not true because plenty of people, including the prophets, have made mistakes mm -hmm. and therefore are fallible. And uh, I think we have to be very careful not to conclude that it was the belief in, in Jesus Christ that saved them. It was believing like Jesus Christ that saved them. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is learning to, to think like Jesus. So I, I, I picture Paul as saying to the, to the Galatians, look, look at what your Judaizing friends are asking you to do. Okay, think about the circumcision, all those other things that he thinks you need to do, those people think you need to do. So now I want you to compare the experience of Jesus Christ. He was beat. He wore the crown of thorns. He went through that incredible experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was crucified. And Ellen White adds that despite all of that, his experience, his, his, his the, the spiritual or, or, or mental pain of realizing that he was being separated from the Father was so bad that his physical pain was hardly felt. He said, now, let me see. Which one experiences it went through more for you? These Galatian Jewsizers or these, this Jesus? Which one of these people did more for you? I, I don't think we have even, we haven't begun to comprehend what Jesus went through. I really don't think we have. Well, going back to the early part of the Old Testament, 
Do you think the Adam and Eve outside the garden had some comprehension of what was really involved in offering that first lamb and the lambs that followed it? Did they? What did they think that was going on there? Should have shocked them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they never, no, nobody, intelligent creature had ever seen death until that time. So mm -hmm. it should have uh, really uh, got their attention. Did God? Did God, God kill that first lamb for them, or did he instruct Adam how to do it? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. Or was it no. pure speculation, whether it's called sanctified speculation or not? It, we can't <laughs> find it out of the Bible. No. We can, uh, I think Ellen White said something about patriarchs and prophets, about page 50 or something in there that, that General Area mentions about that yeah. God did. But. Well, we know that unfortunately what happened over time was that they got to the place where they felt like if you have enough lambs to offer, you can sort of sin at, at leisure, you know, and you just offer another lamb. That sounds like uh, paganism. Sounds like uh, indulgences oh. by the Catholic Church. The idea of, of by, by the times of Jesus, they had turned the sacrificial system into like, go, almost like going to Disneyland or something. People were tossing pieces of animal, cutting them up and tossing them and explaining, you know, entertaining people and if you could if you could attract more they had these altars set up all over the the courtyard there and the, if you could attract more people to your place then you got more of the meat wow. well how would the question of substitution re represent how was the question of substitution represented by the sacrificial system what is it clear what substitution meant to those first Jews there traveling in the desert? Well, think about it. They would come, they would place their hands on this lamb, they would cut the lamb's throat, the police, the police, the priest would collect the, the blood, he would throw some of it either on the horns of the altar of the burnt, of burnt offering or sometimes pour it out at the base of the altar. Then he, in, in effect, he was symbolically transferring those sins to the temple. Then on the Day of Atonement, they went through an elaborate process whereby the priest would go into the Most Holy Place and symbolically, at least, he would take those sins, he would bring them out of the temple, he would place them on the head of the scapegoat or Azazel goat, and that goat would be led off by a special person who had been chosen far away from the camp and to be left out there and eventually probably be eaten by a lion or something. And in their minds, they saw, okay, there go my sins. In a very concrete way, they they saw, okay, yeah, my sins are gone. How much staying power did that have with them? Well, how often did they have they to do that? They were ready to go do it again. Yeah. You know, the problem with that story is that it's not even in Scripture. Yeah. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us what the symbolism of it all is. So we are kind of pulling information from our heads or from uh, history of uh, Judaism and uh, before them, the Israelites. How do we know that's really what God's intention was? Yeah. You were talking about Abel, who, I mean, Cain and Abel, and they had to sacrifice. Sacrifice, don't like the word too much because you don't offer anything to God to receive anything back mm -hmm. from God. I think the idea and uh, speculation, just like everything else we say about it, is speculation because it's not in Scripture. But these are people who lived a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And God told them, if you sin, Sin is going to kill you. I'm not sure I agree with you when you say that day you will sin, you will die. Mm -hmm. Over time, sin will kill you. The wages of sin is death. It's not God punishing people because they sinned, no. which means that uh, having no experience with death at all, they needed to realize you sin, look at what sin does. Not only does it kill, but it kills the innocent. That's why it had to be a perfect lamb and ultimately what happens thousands of years later? Mm -hmm. Our sins kill the innocent on the cross and mm -hmm. put him on the cross. Then you get to the story of Cain. And God says, don't, don't even touch the guy. Don't, 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 because if you do, something bad's going to happen. Well, it's seven times worse. But in other words, you're going to keep sin around. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn, learn how sin works. It's an uh, education pro uh, process. Well, what, what actually happens to our sins? Is there anywhere in the Bible that tells what, what happens to our sins? 
they're talking about symbolism, well, cast into the sea and so forth, the purely That's symbolic. The, look, look, at, look at this, Micah 7, 19. Micah 7, 19. You will be merciful to us once again, is talking to God. You will trample our sins underfoot and send them to the bottom of the sea. Is that where all the sins are piled up, at the bottom of the sea? Well, how, how literal do you want to get? I, I'm just reading to you right out of the scriptures. Well, they're out of sight and out of mind at the moment. Well, and that's the point, so isn't it? It's, it's yeah. you know, I will deal with you on the basis of my love rather than on the basis of your sin. And I'm now, just here's the problem. out of the way right now. Here's the problem. And Jesus said, and John repeats several times in the book of Revelation, that God will then judge us according to all that we have ever done. He's, even Solomon said that in Ecclesiastes. Is God going to go dig those sins out of the bottom of the ocean again and hold them up against us? Well, I think uh, when Ellen White was talking about the sacrificial system, the, they're not blotted out until the Day of Atonement. They're covered by the blood. So they, okay. it's, let's, let's think so about that. They're, they're still there. Otherwise, if they were all blotted out, there would no, be you know, no record. No record of those. So uh, what would condemn you? Similar. It's like all the evidence was, was destroyed, and so... <laughs> There's another problem with that, of course, is that um, will there be a massive Bible burning at the gates of the New Jerusalem because we don't want to remember all the sins that the saints committed? What are we going to do about well, that? my sins aren't there. <laughs> 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 well, maybe the they will be. And Abraham's and yeah. Adam's and... And then the other side of that is, okay, if my sins are gone somehow or other, how does Christ's righteousness get transferred to me? That's, that's not represented by the sacrificial system at all. Yeah, that's one of the things is all you see is the death. Mm -hmm. You don't actually see the, the resurrection uh, symbolized there, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why Hebrews it talks about how, you know, this... Uh, could never take away sin mm -hmm. uh, by constantly doing those things. It told us what happened to sin, that it, the, only, the only place for sin is death. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what killed Jesus as well when he uh, mm -hmm. uh, identified himself with us so that uh, we were in him and he was in us. And okay. he died, and then, but now he rose again. And we can consider ourselves alive our, our our life is is in him okay Fred, are you going to comment yeah um, i was going to go there a little bit too it's true that uh, we die because of our sins but what causes us to sin to begin with it's our lack of love mm -hmm. sin is always lack of love and uh, i think that um, the sacrificial system as we call it which was not an offering to god but really an offering to self because it was an opportunity to learn something from what was happening there. Mm -hmm. Just as it is an opportunity for us to learn from Jesus as he dies on the cross, showing us that love is more important than life, showing us that it's better to die loving than to die fighting and thus returning evil for evil, which gets us nowhere. So the, I think that all this symbolism that's been applied to a lot of these concepts, they're all speculation, we haven't really given them enough thought to mm -hmm. show that the message of Christ really shines through, even in the Old Testament, when we understand what this is. Repeatedly in the New Testament, we have Abraham held up as a great example of faith. So let's think, what did Abraham do? Well, God spoke to him. And he left his home, crossed the Euphrates River, went to a place called Ur, uh, I'm sorry, went to a place called Haran, uh, Haran, if you want to say it that way. Uh, stayed there for a period of time. His father died. Then he traveled all the way to the land of Canaan. I mean, look at all the things. He was circumcised. <laughs> he went down to Egypt. He kept following, even though he made lots of, lots of mistakes, he kept following God's direction. Wouldn't, wouldn't that kind of obedience be good enough to earn salvation? See, again, we have a problem with the symbolism because we assume that it's what he did that manifested his faith. He probably understood why he did the circumcision, for example. 
The circumcision was not a matter of just being different from other people around you. Mm -hmm. It was cutting a little piece of yourself. It was a gift of self, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was also reducing the pride of the person who has to undergo this procedure. And uh, everything that God is trying to teach us is about reducing pride so as to increase love. Mm -hmm. And that was true back then. But if we look at circumcision as just an act we do because God said to do it, I'm sure that Abraham knew why he had to do it, which the Bible doesn't tell us. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting to, know, to observe that it's pretty, well, in, in terms of Bible writers talking about Abraham, it seems pretty, pretty clear that faith, di I mean, Abraham did what he did because of his trust in God already. It was the trust that led to him, to his behavior, not his behavior that led to some kind of reward from God. Was that trust built upon just pure speculation, or was it for some experience that built up and increased his uh, understanding, exactly. which gave him faith? Because he, he got to the point where he could trust what God was saying, and, w and he did that under a willingness to listen and take instruction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't want to listen to somebody and take instruction from somebody that's not trustworthy. Now, there's pretty good evidence that Paul was the first writer of the New Testament. That his letters were the earliest. There are some who argue that maybe the book of James was written earlier, but probably Paul was the first writer. I'm sure he didn't say, well, now let me add to the Bible. But pretty soon, others, for example, Peter, recognized his writings as being equal with Scripture from the Old Testament. So Paul, when he's talking about the Bible, he's talking about the Word of God, he has to be referring to what? Oh, what we the, call Old the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament, yeah. Hebrew Bible. This God-breathed words from the Old Testament. That's what the inspired message is. Um, I'm watching the clock, but... Let me read the next section, verses 6 to 14, Galatians 3. Consider the experience of Abraham, as the scripture says, he believed God, that was his trust, his faith, and because of his trust or faith, God accepted him as righteous. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith, and so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Through you, God will bless the whole human race. The, the Hebrew literally says, and the Greek literally says, all the nations. But that's the whole human race. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who, <coughs> all who believe are blessed as he was. Those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse. Now we get to the curse part. For the scripture says, whoever does not always obey everything that is written in the book of the law is under God's curse. Now it is clear that no one is put right with God by means of the law, because the scripture says only the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. But the law has nothing to do with faith. Instead, as the scripture says, whoever does everything the law requires will live. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Jesus Christ, so that through faith we might receive the Spirit promised by God. And there's a lot of back and forth going on there. How does the promises made to Abraham go to us since we're Gentiles because of the death of Jesus, over the life of Jesus? And you all the nations of the world, earth will be blessed. Okay. So that's sort of the, the promise or the prophecy that, that we mm -hmm. will be blessed. And then Paul also in other places talks about, about us being, if we're children of faith, then we are uh, children's of, children of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And, and you could guess that the Judaizers trying to enforce their rules were probably quoting scriptures one after another. So Paul says, Okay, if they're going to quote all the Old Testament scriptures, I can quote Old Testament scriptures too. In fact, I can quote them more extensively from more books of the Bible than they do. They were, I'm sure they were focused on Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. 
Well, he may have been quoting him simply because he had hidden God's word in his heart and, and out sure. of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So he, uh, that was just his motive. Yeah. Uh, but if, you, if, you're, if the people you're arguing against are using a whole bunch of scriptures, why not respond by using a bunch of scriptures? You, you meet them with, you know, scripture with scripture. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, in, in Colossians, I think we have a picture of uh, Paul arguing against these things. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as mm -hmm. do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, uh, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of man? Yeah. So I, I don't think it was just them quoting scripture. They were bringing their own twists and philosophical things. So yeah. these matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. And then he talks about how we're raised up with him and we have, if we have died, therefore you've been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the earth. Mm -hmm. And so the the Judaizers were bringing things down to maybe what sounded like good religion. It's very concrete and things you can do, but it's taking the, the focus off of the heavenly things where our citizenship is, where we've been raised up and seated with him. Okay, here's a, here's a question for you. We live a long time after Abraham, about 4,000 years. Abraham was the first one whose life is spelled out in some detail at least in the Bible. Of all the people, he was the first one where, you know, more than a few verses are on his life, a few chapters he has. Do you think he's a great example of faith or would, um, would Martin Luther be a better example or, or John Huss or some of the Walden Seas or Ellen White? I think we have to take it in the context of what was happening around him at that time. We know that even his father was uh, dealing in idols mm -hmm. and selling idols. This gives us a little picture of the kind of world Abraham was living in. For him to come out of all those lies regarding the way they regarded the gods and not just God was not an easy task. He must have understood something about the only true God that his contemporaries had a very difficult time understanding. That was the faith that drove him. Sure, he made mistakes, but the focus of his faith was that there's one God, that God is the example of what I should become. I was, we were created in his image. We must be re returned to that uh, same condition. And but, but didn't Martin Luther do that when he faced up the Catholic Church? He did it in the context of his time. By then, we already had the writings of Paul and so many others. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we were better off, you might say, in terms of knowledge from God than was Abraham in his context. Okay. Well, the ultimate example is, is Christ, though. That's where our faith should be, not yeah. I'm of Abraham or I'm a Martin Luther. But, yeah. but he had it it's from Christ. God, and that's Yahweh, and it's Christ just the same. Okay, so now let's, we, we, we're running out of time. Let's, let's really try to focus on what's the relationship between faith and <coughs> obedience to the law. Now Abraham is one of, of just a, two or three people that, that are described in the Bible as a friend of God. What, what does that imply? The two walk together unless they agree. So if you're, you're uh, somebody's friend, means you experience things together, and if okay. you're, you're walking with them, you're agreeing with them. You remember the story of Abraham, the time when one day he's sitting in the shade, and here comes three people walking down the road, and he jumps up and says, oh, please come in. Have He didn't know who they were. He welcomed in. Of course, we know now that one of them was Jesus Christ, and two of them were angels. And he offers them food, and they ate. And then he goes walking down with Jesus himself over to the edge of the Jordan Valley, looking down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jesus says to him, I think I'd better tell, Abraham, I said apparently and to himself, it's implied in scripture, I think I'd better tell Abraham what I'm about to do. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to burn those cities to a crisp. And Abraham says, hold on now, 
You're the God of the universe. You can't do that. I mean, look, let me read from my Good News translation. Surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. That's impossible. You can't do that. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. That's impossible. The judge of all the earth has to act justly. Have you ever talked to God like that? I don't, if we read that passage, I don't see where it says that uh, Yahweh, or is here, I think Jimmy says, the Lord says, I'm going to do it. Uh, he's, the, the conversation is, Abraham says, you wouldn't do it, but God just says, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, well, my Bible says so. he, he asked the angels, should I tell him what? What I'm going to do to right. Simon Gor Gomorrah. Right. Um, I know that. But the Lord, the Lord didn't say he's going to do anything. Well, he said, oh, yes, he does. Where's it, where's back it? to verse 16. Then the men left and went to a place where they could look down at Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord, that's Yahweh, the Lord in small caps, said to himself, I will not hide for Abraham what I am going to do. Yeah, but, but, His descendants will become a great and mighty nation. Through him I will bless all nations. I have chosen him in order that he may command me, so forth. He, he, he honors Abraham. Then the Lord said to Abraham, There are terrible accusations against Sodom and Gomorrah, and their sins are very great. I must go down to find out whether or not the accusations which I've heard are true. And we, we know that that's, a, that's an anthropomorphism. He's trying to speak in language that, that, that we, we can understand. We're, we're implying, though, that when he says that what I'm about to do, Mm -hmm. Is is that I'm going to burn up the people? It doesn't. It really doesn't say that. This uh, is rather true. oleque. Yes, it that's going to be did. what I'm not no, going to allow. No. no. Well, it happened. Also, the, the, they, also they, the fire came down. The fire came down, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Yahweh did it or the Lord did who, it. Who else has the power to do it? Ah, that's a good question. I think the uh, the uh, the other well, nobody Elohim, could do it without God's permission. Oh, I, we're not arguing that. I'm I'm fully in so harmony. God is with responsible. That. Well. God permits Ultimately, God is responsible. Okay, he's also responsibility for giving us free, freedom to make yeah. choices. Mm -hmm. And you can go an awful long way with that. Uh, and that's, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> well, he can say God's he's responsible Job just one. by the matter of what God Job says, 1 and 2. Yeah, what, what God says about Abraham is this. And so this we're, we're trying to figure out where's the relationship between obedience and faith here. Abraham put his trust in the Lord. And this is Genesis 15, 6. And because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Now, we, wouldn't we all want to have, be in that position? God is pleased with us. He accepts us. Now, what was it about Abraham that brought that about? He listened. He listened, yeah. Took some, some instruction. And he, he believed what God told him. Yep. That, that's pretty remarkable if you stop and think about it. If you got somebody that will believe, and God says, hey, that's, that's the right thing to do. If someone comes to you in the middle of the night and says, take your son three days' journey and sacrifice him, and you say, let me talk to my psychiatrist first, uh, what do you say? Well, that wasn't the first encounter, so. No. Uh, unless we've had the number of encounters that Abraham did, we wouldn't be in that position. Which raises the next question then, is faith, or is it fair to say that faith is actually based on evidence? Did Abraham have enough experience with God that he said, I can't understand why he's asking me to do this, but I know the one who's speaking to me, I understand, I don't know whether he recognized his voice or whether he saw a vision as a part of it or whether, but he knew there was no question in Abraham's mind that God had commanded him to do this. So was that, was he basing his faith on evidence or something else? Well, the Hebrews says now faith is the assurance or substance of things hoped for, the conviction mm -hmm. of things not seen. So uh, there's a sense in which why, it's why not just it, blind. Why is it that God tested Abraham that way to find out what he would do, and yet when you go to Job, God already know, knew what he was going to do. No, God already knows what he's going to do here, too. The difference, the difference in, in, in my but opinion... it says pretty clearly, yeah. now I know that yeah. you will not... Yeah. And that's... Well, I, and, and 
pretty much all scholars, I think, agree that that's an anthropomorphism. It means God is acting as if, oh, I just discovered something. Uh, and we know God already knew it, he, but he was speaking in language, which is what we would be, what, how we would speak if we had to do it. It was demonstrated to the rest of the universe. Yeah, and that was, a, was like, the real point was, was like. yeah, the real point was for the rest of the universe we're looking on. Now that, we can say that because we know about the great controversy. So do we all have to go through that kind of a thing for the universe to let us in? Absolutely. You think so? Yeah. Well, God will choose. <laughs> God chooses to deal with each one of us. Remember it says he would not allow you to be tempted more than you're able to bear. So there's going to be some people living at the end of this world's history they are going to go through some, something that may be even worse than that. I mean, think about the devil. His, line, his, his neck is on the line. Well, our lesson emphasizes that we are saved by what, by what Christ has done for us. What about what the Holy Spirit is doing in us? Does that make any difference? Is that also good news? Well, I think Ellen White says that without the Holy Spirit, what Christ had done wouldn't have had any effect. It's, the Spirit brings us uh, mm -hmm. the things of Christ. He points to Christ. He um, mediates uh, you know, the grace that flows from the throne of God. Yeah. It's almost like the spirit is the good, the evil spirit is the bad. So whatever we're doing is what spirit we have in us. Do you think we have? Oh, go ahead. Well, yes. The, the spirit is what motivates our actions. So you know, Jesus told the disciples, "You don't know what spirit you're of." When they mm -hmm. wanted to call fire down, uh, they couldn't didn't understand. You know, because they could have had a text for that. You know. Yeah. But, Elijah did this, so. Do you, you think that we're, we're sort of looking at the Abraham story and then we're sort of drawing on that. Um, do you think God appeared to Abraham and, and, and communicated with Abraham a lot more times than the ones we have recorded in the Bible? Yes. Probably so, huh? Yeah. Probably so. Good chance of it. <clears throat> so. How many, uh, go ahead. You know, at the beginning of this lesson, we're talking about Paul and his calling the people foolish. Is it because we as people, we see something and it's dramatic and we mm -hmm. embrace it, and then we continue on with our lives, and the Spirit is to continue on with us, and when we ignore the Spirit, isn't that what Paul is saying, we are just stupid? Yeah. Well, our lesson suggests that there's at least three things that we should learn from the story of Abraham. One, faith is more than just a belief in God. Clearly, Abraham had a personal relationship with the divine. We've already discussed that in some detail. Are we open to God's voice in our lives? How many different ways does God speak to us? And we don't have time to think about all those possibilities, nature, the revelation, the scriptures. We would add the writings of Ellen White, uh, visions, impressions, all those kinds of things. That, well, um, so, and remember that Abraham was being promised all those things about a son. He's 75 years old. We don't know whether, era, whether um, Sarah had stopped having periods by that time or not, but she was getting older, and he, he still isn't going to get his son for 25 more years. I mean, that's what you call testing someone's faith. Number two, did God practice progressive revelation to Abraham? What do we mean when we say progressive revelation? Well, Jesus told the disciples, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. So, uh, just, you know, if you went to a lecture of some astrophysicist or particle physicist or whatever, and had all of these math equations, you know, you, you don't just jump into that. So <laughs> you start yeah. with math and you work your way up. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and some of us don't ever get it. Maybe more right. like perception, other than, uh, you know, God, the information is available, but uh, are we ready to understand it? We used to have a, a magazine that we produced called Present Truth. Mm -hmm. yes. Does that talk about progressive revelation? Now think about that, you out there. See, that, I wonder sometimes if the progressiveness is not progressiveness away from the falsehood that they understood. 
the truth itself is very simple. But to get Abraham out of that mindset, that was the mindset of that time. Now that had to be progressive because you can't just shed in one sitting all the falsehood you've learned about God. So what you're really saying is it's a lot harder to unlearn what yes. you've learned than it is to learn what you need to learn. Yeah. Okay, number three, we're running out of time. When God finally said to Abraham, I will come back next year at this time and you will have a son. And remember that both when, when that message came to Abraham and then later to Sarah, they both laughed. And so what did God do? He says, well, name the boy laughter. <laughs> I love that. We've talked about the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. The Old Covenant basically was the children of, of Israel promising that they would serve God at the foot of Mount Sinai. We know how long that lasted. But the New T Covenant, it turns out, is God making all the promises. Amazing. Just amazing. I will do this. I will put the law in your hearts. I will do so. It's all God's promises. Is that reliable stuff? Mm -hmm. If God promises that we better believe it, so if God does all the promising, is there anything for us to do? Is this a covenant or is this a will? Remember, a covenant is agreement between two groups of people. A will is saying, when I die, there's no agreements here. It's just, I declare, this is what's going to happen. It's, it's a our, covenant. It's a covenant. Okay. What would you do if you got a message from God in the middle of the night to take your miracle son? Think about Abraham. It's hard. <laughs> oh boy. Well, the the friends of Abraham. I, I'm sorry. The the opponents of Paul. The people I want to talk about now as we draw a conclusion. Were holding up all their promises supposedly from the Old Testament. If you do all this stuff, you'll be blessed. And if you do all those things, you'll be cursed. Remember Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And uh, after 40 years, they, still hadn't done, they were still as, as bad off as they had been before that. So how important is it for us to worship God? Do we, do we really need to obey Him? And what's the relationship between obedience and faith? I'm still going to leave you with that question because that's really, the, I think, the key question uh, in this section of, of, of Galatians. Or was the, what God tried to do there a demonstration of what the truth is? Um, there's a lot of stuff here in Galatians, and you understand that. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned. Our kind and loving Father, there are so many questions in this section of Galatians that we could never begin to answer them all, but they are really good questions. They are questions that focus on real important issues and real truths. Help us to comprehend what we're capable of comprehending, and may present truth be with us. May we, each time we go over this material, learn something more as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.